It's a Sunday flight home today. Today is the 21st Sunday after the Feast of the Holy Trinity. Let me check on that. Today is the 20th Sunday after the Feast of the Holy Trinity. That's pretty bad. You can tell you're traveling when you know what day it is. That means 20 weeks ago we had Holy Trinity Sunday. 21 weeks ago, Pentecost Sunday. We're getting close to the end now close to the festive season. These are the ways of counting the, the seasons uh, of the summer. And we had this beautiful text today uh, from Matthew's Gospel where Jesus tells the parable of the king who throws a, a feast for his son. And this, it's an amazing story because it could end like at any point. It's, this has like three endings. So Jesus says there's a king and he threw a feast for a wedding feast for his son and he went out and invited the people and they made all these excuses. And he went and he invited them again and he said, come on, come to the feast. You think, oh, that could be, that's a, that's a glorious passage right there, just in there. But it doesn't end there. The, the people who are invited don't come to the feast. They give all these excuses why they can't come. In fact, if you look, in, in Moses, in Deuteronomy, gave reasons why the people could, could refuse to go to war if, you, if they bought land, if they just got married, if they just bought oxen and they needed test and so forth. And, and the people in the parable give all of those same reasons to Moses, or to, to, the, to the people invited to the feast that Moses said they could give. So instead of, instead of acting like they've been invited, been invited to the feast of the, of the king's son, they, they act like they've been invited to go to war. So they send all these excuses, and not only that, but they go and they kill the people who came and invited them. So the master's angry, and he sends his soldiers to destroy these people. I mean, he destroys their homes, burns down the city. They're just devastated. So the, this parable is like this, right? And, and, and so we start here, feast, and then we're like this, whoa. But then it could end there, but it doesn't. The, the, the master says, look, the feast is ready. I need people to come and eat my feast. So he sends his servants out to go and call everybody, the good and the evil, it says. Just get everybody in here. And then, and then he goes and he sees there's still room. And so he says, just grab everybody off the sides of the highways and, and bring them into the feast. It's fantastic. We think, okay, that's great. Let's end it there. But Jesus doesn't end there. There's one more movement of this four movement parable. Jesus uh, says that the master is walking around the feast and he finds a man there who's not wearing his wedding garments. And he grabs that. This, the, it's worse for this guy than anybody else. It grabs him and he throws him out. And Jesus switches from parable language to true language. He says he throws him into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is, this is the language that Jesus uses to talk about hell. So this guy's thrown out of the wedding feast because he does because he doesn't have his wedding garment on. And we said, now what is the big deal that not, not having a garment? But this reminds us how wonderfully of how it was in the Garden of Eden. Remember that? Uh, Adam and Eve had thought that they had clothed themselves well with their fig leaves, but, but, the, but they hear the sound of the Lord walking in the garden and they say, we're, we're as good as naked. We're not clothed well enough. I think, by, by the way, the, the fig leaves of Adam and Eve are like a picture, a parable of every man-made religion that is our, that we attempt by our own efforts to cover our own shame. And, and it's insufficient. I mean, we think it's good enough until we hear the footsteps of God coming and then we realize, oh man, I'm, now I'm in trouble. I can't, I can't close, I can't hide my own shame. I can't cover my own guilt. God looks at Adam and Eve in those fig leaves and he says, that's not sufficient. And so what happens? It's an amazing thing to consider that the Lord goes and he grabs a hold of an animal. I mean, we don't know what animal it was, a lamb or a goat or a bear, or it could have been that animal that God grabbed went extinct because there was only two of them and they hadn't had kids yet. And God takes the animal and he kills the animal and he strings it up and he skins it. And he takes the skin of that first sacrifice and he wraps it around the naked bodies of Adam and Eve. They take, their fig leaves aren't sufficient. They need the, they need the skin that's made with, that has blood on it. It is an, uh, an, an absolutely incredible and astonishing thing to consider how 
the very first thing to die in all of the universe is an animal that's killed by God in order to clothe Adam and Eve. You just think of the tears running off of God's face as this animal dies for, for our first parents. And Adam and Eve have to look at this, this bleeding, dying animal and think to themselves, this is what it takes to, to cover our sin and our shame? And God says, this is just the beginning. I mean, this is pointing, this animal that's killed there on that day is just pointing to the, to the death of Jesus, which is really what it takes to cover our sin and our shame. So that to be clothed in perfection and to be clothed in righteousness means to be clothed with, a, with the white robe of Christ's own righteousness. Now, to, to, let's just, we had that picture at the beginning. Let's go to the picture at the end. Remember how it is in Revelation 7. There's these, all these 144,000, innumerable multitude that comes and they're clothed in white robes. And the angel says to John, who are these and where have they come from? And he says, you know. And, and the angel says, these are those who have come out of the great tribulation and they've made their robes white in the blood of the lamb. So the picture is, if you can imagine it, like you're, imagine that you're born wearing a white robe and that every time you sin, that robe gets torn or stained or tarnished in some way. Now imagine at the end of your life, this robe is just in absolute tatters. It's filthy, it stinks, it's, it's rags and threads. It's not white anymore, it's black. And yet when you go now to, the, to this Feast of the Lamb, there's a, a vat filled with blood and you take that white robe and you dip it in that vat and you pull it out and it comes out white and glorious without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. And now you're clothed in this robe, not of your own doing. It's not the fig leaves of your own works, but it's the white robes of the sacrifice of Christ. Now back to the wedding feast. That's why the clothing matters. If we want to stand in the king's feast wrapped in our own goodness or whatever, or, or, or even parading around in our own sin, then we're not fit. But when we, have the, when we have the white robes, the perfect clothes of the righteousness of Jesus, now we're made fit for that wedding feast. And those are the robes that, that are given to us in our baptism. Paul says, don't you know that all who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have put on Christ so that we are clothed with Christ. We, have, we wear the perfection of Jesus and that mercy and that kindness is what makes us fit for this great feast of the King. <laughs> now that is really, really wonderful. The Sunday flight home. That is my airplane going to Denver. Although I'm boarding group C27, so I'll be sitting back there by the bathroom <laughs> taking a nap. <laughs>